It is a very great honour to give this lecture about Henry Chadwick, his life and his work at the opening of his library at St Michael's Abbey. Henry was a friend, a mentor and one of the kindest and most gracious people I've had the pleasure of knowing. I hope I can convey something of all of that to you today, along with a sense of his brilliance and his huge contribution to academia and the life of the church. It is my pleasure to acknowledge the generosity of his daughters, Priscilla, Hilary and Juliet, in allowing me to use correspondence held by the family and not in the public domain in the writing of this lecture. I offer my heartfelt thanks to Roberta Amundsen for the kind invitation to give the lecture. I'm deeply grateful. Thank you. I offer my thanks also to Anne Haru and Father Ambrose for help with details along the way. And finally, I offer my very sincere apologies to all of you for not being able to give this lecture in person as I'd hoped because of the pressures of term time. I was so much looking forward to attending this special event and being with you all on this very special occasion. My only consolation is that I know Henry himself would have understood, having been head of an Oxford college and understanding the pressures of the middle of the term. Augustine felt the cold. So Henry Chadwick began a short biography of Augustine of Hippo, which was published posthumously in 2009. The manuscript was found after Henry had died by his wife Peggy. It was in a brown paper parcel under the carpet. Peggy immediately understood its significance and importance. Chadwick understood the power of the telling detail. We are at once drawn into the book. Immediately we think, what an unusual opening sentence. Then we ask, how do we know that Augustine felt the cold? Answer, no figure of the ancient world is more accessible to us, as Chadwick wrote. And as the deceptively simple opening sentence draws us in, we realise that one reason we go to Augustine for so much is because he gives us so much. We go to his work not just for vivid details about the man himself, though there are plenty of those in the Confessions, but also for some of the most compelling accounts in Christian theology of the human condition, the nature and destiny of human beings, and God's plan for us. I commend to you all Chadwick's brilliant short biography, A Distillation of the Life and Thought of Augustine, as well as Henry Chadwick's wonderful translation of The Confessions, which was voted the Church Times' number one book of the hundred best ever religious books a few years ago. One of Henry Chadwick's many gifts, and he had very many, as you will see, was to write with absolute clarity and perspicacity about the central themes of a theologian's thought and life, while also drawing us in with a particular story or striking example. He was helped in this by a fearless editor, Peggy Chadwick, his much beloved wife. Henry, and I now feel I must call him Henry rather than Chadwick, for I am speaking of him as a friend and often of stories he told to me. Henry also knew how to tell a good story about himself. So let's go back to the beginning. Henry was born on June the 23rd, 1920, the fourth of six children, four boys, two girls, to a brilliant barrister father, John, an expert in property law, and Edith, a musician, who was a fine pianist. Henry grew up in the south of England, in Bromley in Kent, but his family roots were in fact northern, from Lancashire, where his grandfather had been a mining engineer. Music was, in so many ways, Henry's first love, inherited from his mother and developed while he was a schoolboy at Eton, one of the finest private schools in England for boys, where he was a King Scholar. Henry's father died when Henry was 10, and Henry wrote about the fact that music provided him much solace at that time. When he went to mu Eton, music was, he said, my consuming desire. I spent every even song with Henry Lay in the organ loft, which I should not have been doing had I intended to be a classic. Given that he later became one of the most brilliant patristic scholars of the 20th century, 
and made his name as a young scholar with a superb translation from the Greek of Origen's Contra Celsum. It's interesting that classics didn't fully capture his attention when he was a boy. He wrote, I never had much difficulty with Greek grammar, but when I got to Eton, my companions were mostly better at Greek and Latin and worse at music. Henry was a brilliant musician and received a scholarship to read music as an undergraduate at Morgan College, Cambridge, when he was only 16. The college had to hold the scholarship for him for a year because he was so young. In describing his interview for that music scholarship, Henry spoke about it in a typically humorous and self-deprecating manner, again with an eye for that telling detail, in this case, one musical note. He had to give a practical demonstration of his ability as an organist. He arrived early at Trinity College, Cambridge, where the organ trials were being held, and he heard another boy playing the organ, who was also in competition for the scholarship. Henry's heart sank when he realised that they had each chosen the same piece of music, Bach's St Anne Fugue in E-flat major. The other boy was playing it wonderfully well, and Henry became more and more despondent while listening to him. And then came the final note. A notoriously tricky final note to be played on the pedals with the left foot. The other boy misstepped and hit the wrong pedal. Henry thought to himself, I just have to get the last note right and I'll be all right. He did and he was. The Bach St Anne Fugue remained uh, an important and much loved piece of music to him throughout his life and it was played at the end of both memorial services for him in Oxford and Cambridge. It was also at Eton that Henry's Christian faith was sparked was sparked by a teacher called Sladen, who kept the boys enthralled with stories from the Hebrew scriptures, perhaps some of the more bloodthirsty stories. And it was sparked too by conversations over tea and on walks, particularly with another boy at Eton named Dick Watson, who then invited him to an evangelical house party. Henry later said that he never lost his respect for or understanding of evangelical faith, though that was not his theological position as he grew older. We can also see here that Henry's lifelong habit of collecting books, celebrated by the marvellous library here at the monastery, began early. His response to his increasing interest in Christianity was to acquire, by the age of 15, the entire set of Clarendon biblical commentaries, many of them bought secondhand from another boy at Eton. Many expected Henry to take up a career in music. He certainly had the ability. Instead, he went to theological college, which is what we call seminary here in Britain, after he completed his undergraduate degree in music in 1941, following in his older brother Owen's footsteps. Later, a younger brother, Martin, also became an Anglican priest. Henry received his ordination training at Ridley Hall, the Evangelical Theological College in Cambridge, also reading for the Cambridge degree in theology, and much influenced by his tutor Wilfred Knox, a New Testament scholar whose mind, Henry once said to me, lived in the byways of ancient Greece and Rome. Henry was ordained by William Temple, the Archbishop of Canterbury, in Canterbury Cathedral in 1943, right in the middle of World War II. He took up a curacy, which is the first job Anglican priests do when they're ordained, he took up a curacy at a solidly evangelical parish, Emmanuel Church in Croydon, Surrey, though he was already beginning to describe himself as more Catholic, with a small c, in his Anglican identity. It was during this curacy that his former teacher, Wilfred Knox, and Charles Raven, then the Regis Professor of Divinity at Cambridge, asked him to work on an edition of Origins Contra Celsum for Cambridge University Press. Henry was rather hesitant at first, though his patristic Greek was certainly excellent by then, but he realised he would have to read all of Plato and all of the Stoics and learn about the magic of the Hellenistic underworld. In due course, he was persuaded and accepted the assignment. He worked away at the translation in his spare time, 
although pastoral duties in the parish were considerable, especially given that it was wartime and his parish was directly under a German bombing route to London. In 1944, Henry described explosions nearby as the last lash of the dying dragon's tail. War also led to a prolonged engagement to the woman he wished to marry, Margaret Peggy Brownrigg, whom he had first met in 1940 in Cambridge when she was evacuated there from her London college. Peggy was training to be a teacher and also a very fine singer and musician. Peggy and Henry finally were able to marry at the end of the war in 1945, but rationing was still ongoing, which meant that coupons to buy clothing were also still limited. So Peggy was creative and the bridesmaids' dresses were made from curtains. Peggy always liked to say that she had married her accompanist, who could transpose effortlessly into any key in which she wished to sing. After a brief stint as assistant chaplain at Wellington College, a boys' school where both Peggy and his brother Owen were teaching, Henry returned to Cambridge to be chaplain and then dean of chapel at Queen's College and lecturer in theology in the university. It was while they were in Cambridge that he and Peggy had their three daughters, Priscilla, Hilary and Juliet, all sitting in the audience today, and Henry continued to publish. Although, as he wrote in 1952, the tension between the chores of college duty and pastoral care on one side and the incessant demand for learning and knowledge on the other is well nigh intolerable. I fear that at the moment I'm letting the latter go completely by the board, though one feels it is really the line of least resistance. Despite these tensions, in 1953, his translation and critical edition of Origins Contracelsum came out. It was the work that made his name. It was also the work on which Peggy first exercised her insightful editing skills, and it is dedicated to her. The critical edition had not been an easy task, as Henry had foreseen. Rowan Williams describes the tricky text like this. It is a dauntingly complex work, since it contains the great Alexandrian theologian's point-by-point -point refutation of one of the most thoroughgoing pieces of learned pagan polemic against the Christian faith in that era. We might add that given that we don't have the original work by Celsus, only the sections of it quoted by Origen, and given that we know little about Celsus or his background, the task of reconstructing his intellectual and religious world was really considerable. The introduction to the edition demonstrated that Henry was more than up to it. His capacity to master an enormous amount of intellectual ground and present it to the reader, not only with a sure grasp, but with an enviable lucidity and brevity is absolutely clear in that brilliant introduction. And the translation itself was of consummate elegance. One patristic scholar, Rebecca Lyman, told me that it was reading Henry's Contra Celsum as an 18-year-old undergraduate in Michigan that inspired her to go to Oxford to do her doctorate on origin. And as she said to me, almost everything since has felt less interesting than origin in Chadwick prose. Henry made a few minor amendments to the text a few years later for a second edition, and it still remains the standard edition of this work over 60 years later. With this publication and a series of learned and original articles, Henry was now beginning to be known as a fine expositor of patristic texts and as one who had an increasingly impressive knowledge of the philosophical and religious world of late antiquity. Further publications followed, including, as homage to his teacher Wilfred Knox, the completion of Knox's manuscript on the sources of the Synoptic Gospels, one of Henry's several forays into the world of New Testament scholarship. In 1954, Henry took on the co-editorship with the biblical scholar Hedley Sparks of the Journal of Theological Studies, an important journal in the field. It was a task he did with amazing thoroughness and generosity for over 30 years until 1985. In 1957, 
he received an honorary doctorate of divinity from Glasgow University, the first of many such honours. And let's remember how young he still was, just 37 years old. In the following year, 1958, at the age of 38, he was appointed to one of the most prestigious of all academic positions in Britain, the Regis Professorship of Divinity at Oxford. This is a crown appointment, meaning that the Queen makes the appointment with the advice of the Prime Minister, who in turn takes advice from senior academics in the field. Based at Christchurch, a college at Oxford which unusually has a cathedral within it, the chair is combined with a canonry at the cathedral, which entails regular clerical duties and the pleasure of choral evensong and matin sung by a superb choir of men and boys, as well as all the usual teaching duties that go with a professorship. Henry began the job in April 1959, the beginning of what Oxford calls Trinity term. We have a three term rather than two semester system here. In order that Priscilla, Hilary and Juliet could finish out their school year in Cambridge, he commuted to Oxford each week for that term, spending weekends with the family in Cambridge. C.S. Lewis, long a faculty member at Oxford, had recently accepted a new professorship at Cambridge, but he continued to live in Oxford, so he was doing the reverse commute. Henry and Lewis would meet, meet each other every Monday and Friday in Bletchley, where they changed trains, and they struck up a friendship. The friendship clearly endured because four years later, after C.S. Lewis had had a heart attack and was just beginning to get out and about, we hear that Peggy took him for a drive in the Chilterns to see the autumn leaves in the mist and waning sun in the beautiful Oxfordshire countryside. Henry noted that Lewis's conversation was still as brilliant as ever. I'd like to note that taking Lewis for this drive when he was convalescing was a very typical act of kindness on Peggy's part. In the summer of 1959, the family packed up their things in Cambridge and arrived to live in a house on the job in Tom Quad, the huge central quad at the heart of Christchurch. Tom Quad would be their home for the next 20 years. And the two houses they occupied there, each for 10 years, were both very large. And this enabled Henry's voracious book collecting habit to flourish. By 1959 and before the age of 40, Henry was established as one of the leading scholars of patristics and indeed a leading historical theologian, holder of one of the most prestigious chairs in his field. The achievement was crowned in 1960 when he was 40 by election as a fellow of the British Academy, the British equivalent of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a mark of the highest distinction for a British scholar. The main strands of Henry's multifaceted life were now in place as scholar, priest, writer, editor, husband and father, book collector and musician. To this he would, in due course, add ecumenist and higher education administrator, the former giving him rather more pleasure than the latter, as we shall see. So let me now outline briefly the main positions that Henry held for the rest of his distinguished career and then for the remainder of the lecture I can speak about the rest of his life uh, thematically. In 1969, two years after arriving as Regis Professor, he became Dean of Christchurch, which meant that he was both head of the college and Dean of the Cathedral, an onerous job which he held for 10 years. He then moved to be Regis Professor of Divinity at Cambridge until retirement, and he was then persuaded out of retirement to become the master of Peterhouse, one of the oldest of all the Cambridge colleges, finally retiring from that post when he was 73. He and Peggy at that point moved back to Oxford, where they lived for the rest of both of their lives. So clearly, Henry had a remarkable career. He was the Regis Professor of Divinity in both Oxford and Cambridge, and the first person to be head of both an Oxford College and a Cambridge College in over 400 years. Let me turn now to scholarship, and I turn first to scholarship because, as his brother Owen, also a distinguished church historian, put it, Henry's affection was scholarship. We might add that music was a very close second, and we'll come to that in a little bit. Today I can only give you a glimpse 
into the vastness of Henry's learning and output. Along with his monographs, his books, which is where I will focus my discussion, there were many translations, articles, seminar papers, invited lectures, and much significant editorial work. Besides being editor of the Journal of Theological Studies, he was also general editor of Black's New Testament Commentaries, the Oxford Early Christian Text Series, and with Owen, the Oxford History of the Christian Church. This work came in part out of a sense of service to academia, but as Owen said, Henry enjoyed being an editor. He liked the process of selecting just the right person to write a piece, ensuring that the information they provided was correct and their judgment authoritative. And he loved footnotes. Owen described his brother as a scholar in this way. He had an excellent memory, a vast store of rare knowledge, a talent for lucid arrangement and exposition, and a judgment which rarely failed him. More a historian than a philosopher by inclination and natural gifts, he made his best contributions to historical theology. He spoke and read German fluently, had a wide academic acquaintance in Europe, and was always ready to help students of every kind. Henry was indeed a fine teacher, sharing his voracious reading and mastery of the field generously. As Owen said, it was almost impossible for a student to overlook an article of substance, however recondite, if he took the trouble to consult Chadwick. Henry was also a superb and popular lecturer. Evan Burge, who went on to become warden of Trinity College at the University of Melbourne in Australia, and a significant scholar of Anglican liturgy, was a graduate student at Oxford, and he described why Henry's lectures on Platonism and Christianity were so captivating. It is partly the humour, partly the rhetoric, at all levels of rhetoric. It is speech like Gothic architecture, a gargoyle here, a spire there. Every so often a great protuberant knob for listeners to hang on to. It is a privilege for us all, a man still young enough to know how to put things over, and yet behind him a lifetime of meditation and study on the theme. Christianity and Platonism were key areas in Henry's scholarship. He had a broad interest in the relationship between pagan culture, Greek thought and Christianity, and a particular interest in the Neoplatonist theologians, especially Origen and Augustine. He was, too, interested in questions of church and authority, which were the subject of both his inaugural lecture at Oxford and the Distinguished Gifford Lectures, which he delivered at the University of St Andrews in Scotland in the mid-60s. Although he never published the Giffords in their entirety, other lecture series did turn into books. In 1962, for example, he was invited to give lectures at Union Theological Seminary in New York, Andover Newton Theological School and Episcopal Theological School in Massachusetts. The result was the masterly early Christian thought and the classical tradition, a book that was written for both the general reader and the theological scholar. These many invitations and the care with which he laboured over the lectures to make them both scholarly and appealing, along with editorial and other commitments, meant that a book that would bring his work to a very wide audience, The Penguin History of the Early Church, was delayed. Owen, general editor of the Penguin series in church history, had first mooted the idea of Henry writing this volume in 1956. Three years later, in 1959, Henry wrote to Owen, Ahem, I promised you the Penguin history by today and have not got further than the end of chapter three, which concludes with Clement and Origen. Chapter four concerns theological debate, but only two or three pages are written so far. At least the ship is well underway. I've decided to try and include all the essential information for undergraduate purposes, hoping to combine the general reader and the student. Is this an error? Perhaps it would be well if you could read what I've done so far. I'm including a lot of thought, not only institutions and organisations, but what did they argue about? Henry was always interested in what they argued about, and perhaps even more interested in how they resolved arguments. And he, all his life, consulted Owen about his writing, just as Owen consulted Henry about his. In 
The book was finally published in 1967 and sold fantastically well for many years to come and still does sell well. It's much loved by students, scholars and general readers alike. In 1969, two years after the publication of that Penguin History, Henry became Dean of Christ Church, a post that was not conducive to getting scholarship done. But even now, when the burden of administration was heavy, Henry managed to write for three hours every day by getting up at four o'clock in the morning, before morning prayer in the cathedral. In this way, he wrote a significant book on the fourth century Spanish bishop, Priscillian of Avila. He wrote to Owen in 1975 while working on the book, I am mountingly fascinated by Priscillian, certainly not orthodox, but most intriguing. He subtitled the book, The Occult and the Charismatic in the Early Church. Priscillian had ultimately been condemned to death by the emperor for sorcery. The book brought together several of Henry's interests, the boundaries between religion and magic, the grey areas between what was becoming orthodoxy and other forms of teaching, such as Gnosticism and Manichaeanism, Man and the extent to which asceticism was being embraced at the time. Priscillian rigorously defended it for both clergy and laity. Priscillian was published in 1976 while he was still dean. Undaunted, he moved on to a new topic immediately, the 6th century Boethius. Published in 1981, once he'd gone to Cambridge, this was a significant work on the 6th century Roman intellectual and author of the Consolation of Philosophy. Here, Henry painstakingly developed and explicated the intellectual landscape of this important text, which went on to have such an influence on the medieval scholastics. In it, he discussed the theology and music, but also philosophy and logic, which was so important to Boethius' scheme. Henry concluded that the consolation was written with the consciousness of Augustine standing behind the author's shoulder. One might say that Henry had Augustine on his shoulder by this time, for much of his work in the following years was on that great theologian. Several really important articles, the translation of the Confessions, a short book in Oxford's past master series, and the biography with which I opened this lecture, which was of course not published until 2009. Henry published two more big books, both in the Oxford History of the Christian Church series, which he jointly edited with Owen. The first, in 2001, covered the first six centuries of Christian history. It's a marvellously succinct distillation of the key people, texts, ideas and debates of the period. I reach for it often as a modern historian when I need to make sense of something. The final book, dedicated to his wife as his first was, and published in 2003, was a product of both his deep learning and his many years of ecumenical work, titled East and West, The Making of a Rift in the Church. The split in 1054 between Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism was, Henry said, the greatest split of all religious divisions. He opened the book rather wistfully with this statement. Religion when shared is one of the strongest social bonds. When differences appear either of right or calendar or social custom or liturgy or above all basic allegiance, this powerful bonding becomes counterproductive and easily engenders deep divisions. And so let us now turn to the important work of furthering ecumenical relations to which Henry was dedicated for so much of his life. In 1967, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael Ramsey, set up ARCIC, the Anglican Roman Catholic Commission. The point of it was to work towards Roman Catholic and Anglican unity. Henry was invited to join two years later in 1969 and rapidly became a central part of the group. He was part of it for 12 years initially, the first phase of Archic's work, where they talked about and wrote about the Eucharist, ministry and authority. Henry's intellectual strengths played to the work of Archic, of trying to resolve theological differences between the two churches. Always committed to keeping the conversation going and trying to reach consensus, Henry's tack was to excavate common first principles. In 
to prepare for his role in Archic, he had read through the entire body of work on the doctrinal differences between the two churches since the 16th century and the multi-volumed Acta of the 16th century Roman Catholic Reforming Council of Trent. During this first phrase of Archic's work, the two churches came to agreement on many issues, but famously, one stalling point was when the Roman Catholic representatives disagreed amongst themselves about transubstantiation. It was Henry, the Anglican, who resolved their impasse with a brilliant footnote. I told you he liked footnotes, and indeed he wrote that footnote overnight. Indeed, Henry was the author of large swathes of the final documents. Given that he was Dean of Christchurch for much of this time, this first phase of, of 12 years of archic work, everything took its toll, as you might imagine. The historian Eamon Duffy tells the story of one episode when the group was meeting in Venice at a time when they were discussing the authority of the church. One of the more exhausting archic meetings in Venice during a torrid summer, Henry collapsed. He was taken to the hospital though the fainting fit turned out to be not life-threatening. As he surfaced from unconsciousness, he saw the anxious faces of his archic colleagues gathered around his bed. A faint Chadwickian voice greeted them from the pillow. I see I am not in heaven. And he was also a member of archic for part of its second session in the 1980s, when they discussed salvation and ecclesiology. And it was during this time that a visit by Pope John Paul II to Britain was planned. Henry, highly regarded by his Roman Catholic and Anglican colleagues, was asked by the Archbishop of Canterbury, who by that time was Robert Runcie, to negotiate some of the preparations for the visit so that expectations would be realistic all round. And so Henry had lunch with the Pope. As a sign of gratitude at the end of the meal, the Pope presented Henry with a stole. This was much valued by Henry and much appreciated. And the stole was laid on Henry's coffin at his funeral. Henry had great hopes for reunion between the two churches and was disappointed it didn't come about. But he was also realistic about the dynamics and difficulties of ecumenical dialogue. When he visited Rebecca Lyman's class on church history, at the Episcopal Seminary in Berkeley in California in the late 1980s, he described the ecumenical dialogues he was then engaged in as two male lions roaring at each other until the work could begin. Let us turn now to higher education administration, for want of a better term. In 1969, Henry became Dean of Christchurch, an onerous double job, as I noted earlier. He didn't find it easy. It was a fractious academic community. It still is. And Henry's naturally ironic style and capacity to see all sides of an argument weren't always appreciated by colleagues up for a fight. A perennially con contentious issue in the 1970s was, as Henry put it in many letters to Owen, that of church versus state. This was, remember, in a college that had a cathedral as part of its foundation and where the four main chairs in theology had to be occupied by Anglican priests because they were attached to cathedral canonries. So a kind of old fashioned anti-clericalism emerged whenever one of these chairs was vacated as some of the dons rushed in to argue to laicize them. Writing to Owen in 1973, uh, 1972, which was three years into his being dean, he said, I fear I'm running into a minor row about the canonries and chairs again. I expect thunder and I may fall. This kind of argument occurred on a number of occasions and sometimes there was a bit of thunder, but of course Henry didn't fall. But it was a part of the job he didn't relish. The busyness of being dean was combined with various roles across the university where his good judgment and wisdom were greatly appreciated. He took his turn, as heads of college are called to do, in chairing numerous committees, and he was a long-standing member of the university's main decision-making body, the Hebdomadal Council. He was a delegate at Oxford University Press, approving books for publication, and he also spent a year as a pro-vice-chancellor. 
Henry once told me the number of committees he chaired at that time. I'm afraid I can't remember the exact number now, but it was at least 30-some. But the point is that Henry remembered the exact number and the burden that it represented several decades later. He was also, of course, Dean of the Cathedral with regular liturgical and preaching duties. He attended matins and even song every day and all four services on a Sunday. Although this was a considerable commitment, it was from this daily round of prayer that he drew sustenance and the congregation appreciated him greatly as Dean. As Rome Williams has expressed it, in the cathedral, his preaching, his beautifully musical reading of prayers and lessons, and his great natural dignity combined to make him, in the eyes of many, the perfect deaconal figurehead. He was said to be the only cleric in the Church of England who could read the King James Version of Job, chapter 39, verse 25, he saith among the trumpets, ha ha, in a manner both stirring and decorous. And my apologies that I cannot read it like Henry would have read it. Henry took his pastoral duties as a priest seriously, albeit often discreetly, even when he was very busy. When J. N. L. Myers, who had taught at Christ Church and then served as Bodleian's librarian, the university librarian, essentially, when Myers was seriously ill in hospital, he came out of his coma and he found that there by my bedside was the Dean of Christchurch reading to me one of the novels of Jane Austen. Peggy was a great support in all of this, not only as the one who read and edited his work, but also as hostess for numerous dinners, tea parties and events in the deanery. Henry wrote that Peggy had been a heroic consort through bumpy times at Christchurch where I was very hard pressed and her hospitality duties were very heavy. She did indeed entertain so many in the deanery, not only students and academics, but also the Queen and Prince Philip, the Dalai Lama and the 12 Buddhist monks who accompanied him amongst many distinguished visitors. Nevertheless, it's still amazing to reflect on how Henry did it all, especially when we consider that he was, as I've noted, also writing books and articles in this time, giving lectures, much engaged in ecumenical work and other acts of service to the church, such as being a theological advisor to the 1978 Lambeth Conference, the once a decade gathering of all bishops from around the Anglican Communion. Towards the end of his time as Dean of Christchurch, in 1977, he sat down and calculated all his earnings from his books. For example, the Penguin History of the Early Church was selling 14,000 copies a year. And he said to Owen, why do we work at these jobs when we could retire on our books? It was, I suspect, a rhetorical question. When the opportunity arose for him to go to Cambridge as Regis Professor, he took it. He did in fact retire a little early from that post at the age of 63, but he was tempted out of retirement, as I said, age 67 to become head of Peterhouse, where he spent six years. And there his ironic style suited the atmosphere of that college perfectly and played a part in shifting its culture for the better. So while it's always attractive to think about just writing books, and believe me, I understand that, Henry clearly had a deep, an enduring sense of service to both the academic community and the worldwide church. Nevertheless, he worried later in life that academics no longer had enough time to get on with their scholarship. He wrote to Owen in 1996, by which time he had definitively retired and could often be found in Oxford li Oxford's libraries. What is the contemporary university's function? I see almost no dons in Bodley, that's the main Oxford Library. Oxford tutors are notoriously worked too hard. Let us now turn to the very happy subject of book collecting. Henry was, as the new library at the Abbey testifies, passionate about collecting books. And this library contains some 15,000 of his volumes, the bulk of his collection. Before the advent of the internet, 
second-hand bookshops would regularly send out catalogues listing the books they had for sale. Probably some of you will remember this. When these catalogues arrived, it was a matter of enormous pleasure for Henry to sit down, carefully read them and annotate them in pencil in his beautiful handwriting, deciding which books he wished to buy. He could not be disturbed during this process. And Henry also knew from where and at what price he had obtained all of his books. This book for X shillings from some backyard bookstore in Cambridge, that book from an antiquariat in Cologne for so many marks, and so on. Henry's collection was, as you know, strongest in his own area of study, patristics. But it covers many other areas too, not least the necessary histories of Roman Catholicism and Protestantism since the Reformation, which, as we've seen, he read diligently as he was engaged in the Arctic talks. He also loved to select just the right books for fellow scholars and friends, and I always remember the smile on his face when P he and Peggy arrived at my 40th birthday lunch party. Henry was clutching a first edition of John Tolan's Tetradimus from 1720 for me, a wonderful and thoughtful present, because he knew I was working on the English deists at the time, and Toland was first foremost amongst that group. It is, of course, a much prized volume in my own book collection now. Henry didn't always know exactly where particular books were in his vast collection. Peggy usually did. Of course, when they moved to Cambridge in 1979, when their 20 year sojourn at Christchurch was over, there was a question of how to accommodate all the books. They'd just been living in two huge houses, remember, and no house came with the new Cambridge job. So they had to buy a big enough house to contain the books. The same problem occurred when Henry retired from the Regis Professorship in Cambridge and they moved back to Oxford. But then he came out of retirement four years later and went back to Cambridge. Six years later, they returned to Oxford for good. Each time they went back and forwards to Cambridge, backwards and forwards to Cambridge, the books went with them. So I can reassure you that the collection was already well-travelled even before it was shipped to California. As we all know, packing and moving that many boxes of books is a huge task. When Owen, who had been master of Selwyn College in Cambridge and was moving out of the big house, the lodge that came with the job, Henry had complete empathy. Moving out of a master's lodge is misery and we loathed it in 1979, so I sympathise deeply if you and Ruth have sensations of amnesia, etc. The huge size of the deanery at Christchurch enabled not only the collecting of books. In 1977, John Chadwick, Henry's other older brother, a senior diplomat, was moving house to Oxfordshire and he asked if he might store a few bottles of wine in the empty space in the deanery cellars. Henry said yes. The wine arrived and it turned out that John had actually become an obsessive collector. Crate after crate after crate poured into the deanery to the astonishment and envy of undergraduates and college staff. Peggy said, with a wry wit to match that of her husband, they ought all to have been disguised as mineral water bottles. Music. Music remained important to Henry throughout his whole life. He continued to play the piano, sometimes playing with his brother Martin and with colleagues at Oxford and Cambridge. And even in his mid-80s, he was still learning and practising some tricky Schubert. His daughters are musical, Priscilla and Juliet playing the violin, Hilary the cello, so they could make a quartet with Henry playing the piano and he could fill in the notes for us if needed as Priscilla put it. Henry described music as a ladder of ascent, taking this metaphor from the great mystics of the Christian tradition. It was a connection he had with Augustine, of course, as Peter Brown, another giant of the field of late antiquity and an Augustine scholar too, writes, Chadwick numbered himself amongst those whom Augustine, who knew all too well the pull of music 
at the base of his own heart, whom Augustine described as persons who count themselves miserable when music is lacking to their lives. Music was, wrote Henry, the art with the greatest detachment from objects we can touch and see, pointed the way from the chaos of our lives towards that which abides. Henry brought his musical expertise to the different realms of his work in a variety of ways. Peter Brown thinks it was music that made Henry such a great and sensitive scholar. It was his musical gift, he writes, that made Chadwick such an exciting expositor of the thought world of late antique persons. Henry wrote, great music requires the listener to apply his attention even to familiar music as if he were hearing it for the first time and were continuously wondering where the music will go next. In the light of this, Peter Brown goes on to say that Henry expounded well-known thinkers with the same rapt attention with which he would perform a musical composition. He knew how to convey ideas in motion. He could seize the nerve centres of entire bodies of thought, but he never froze these into static systems. He followed them through as if he were continuously wondering where the thought, like the music, will go next. In 1970, early on in his time as Dean of Christchurch, Henry succeeded in appointing the brilliant Simon Preston as organist, a job that entailed not only directing the fine men and boys choir in the cathedral, but also teaching music to undergraduates in the college. It was an excellent appointment and Henry was rightly concerned when in 1973 it looked like King's College Cambridge might poach Preston. They didn't and Preston remained at Christchurch. The relationship wasn't always easy and there was one tense Christmas when Henry feared that some of the traditional carol services might be replaced by symphony concerts in a nod to the anti-clericalism that was in parts of the college. But the fear passed. Preston's appointment was one of the many significant contributions that Henry made to Christchurch while he was dean. In the early 1980s, Henry took up the chairmanship of Hymns Ancient and Modern Limited, a publishing company which produced not only hymn books, but also two book imprints, Canterbury Press and SCM Press, and published the weekly newspaper, The Church Times. This led some to joke that Henry was the Rupert Murdoch of the ecclesiastical press. Henry had a particular editorial role in the production of their hymn books, especially Common Praise, which came out in 2000, and by special request of Henry, included the spiritual Steal Away, which was sung at his funeral. In conclusion, who was Henry Chadwick the man? Henry was, as Owen put it, tall with a slight stoop, distinguished in appearance and an air of old-fashioned courtesy and a bubbling humour. He was delightful company. I would add to all of this the word elegant. Henry was always elegant in his person and in everything he did, from playing the piano to preaching, from lecturing to writing. And his handwriting was elegant too. Peter Brown described Henry the last time he saw him in this way. It was Henry the listener whom I remember most, as do so many others. When my wife and I last visited him in Oxford, it was his sheer size that struck me. And I think that Peter Brown means Henry's height there. Seated in his chair, he towered above a circle of piled books. And then with infinite grace, he bent to listen. He listened to accounts of my work, and that of others. He listened to my wife. He listened with that air of serious attention with which he had listened to students, to so many friends, to so many in need of counsel and comfort over so many years. My own memory of the last time I saw Henry was that he was listening. He was listening to music on BBC Radio 3 and I knew I needed to be very still and very quiet until the broadcast concert was over. He was listening to a familiar piece as if it were the first time he had heard it. When the radio broadcast was over, we spoke 
He talked a little of the music to which we had been listening and why he loved it. But for the most part, I spoke and he listened. This was only a few months before he died, but he was eager as always to have news of Oxford in all its many facets. He wanted to know what was happening in the overlapping worlds of academia and scholarship, church and music that he had occupied for so many years. As we have seen, his marriage to Pe Peggy was a long and happy one. When he died, they had been married for almost 63 years. It was a mutually supportive union, full of adventures and travel. He was often invited to lecture on Swan Hellenic cruises around the Mediterranean, and he and Peggy thoroughly enjoyed them, especially as the ship and the programme were designed for small groups of people who were serious about learning the history and culture of the places they were visiting. He and Peggy were incredibly intrepid drivers all over Europe on numerous occasions for academic conferences and events, even until late in life. Always he was accompanied by Peggy, who with great kindness made sure he had everything he needed. He was a devoted and much loved father, although he was intensely busy in both of his jobs at Christchurch when the children were growing up. Because they lived right there on the job, he was frequently around so they could eat lunch together and his daughters would see him in the fabric of their days. Once the girls grew up and also started to travel widely, he was always quietly concerned until they arrived home safely, as in 2001 when he wrote to Owen, Our Juliet is holidaying in Cuba. We hope safely. Priscilla is off to Libya on Saturday. I tremble. He was deeply proud of his daughters. Juliet's appointment as a librarian at Exeter College, Oxford. Hillary's responsibility for the government's policy on apprenticeships across a large swathe of southern England. Priscilla's success as principal of Berkhamsted School, where she com skillfully combined two schools, one for boys, one for girls, into one big school. And he would be incredibly proud today that Hilary has just now completed her PhD at University College London. Congratulations, Hilary. He wrote to Owen also of his grandsons, one named after Owen and Nicholas, Hilary's children, what they were up to, and he proudly marked their success in exams and many other areas. Henry lived through rapidly changing times in both higher education and the church, and he adapted with remarkable ease and grace. When he was at Christchurch in the 60s and 70s, it was a time of student rebellion and demonstrations. Henry was courteous throughout, and he often diffused tense, tense situations with a profound graciousness, as this story illustrates. He was in an academic procession going through Oxford, which was being booed by student demonstrators. Janet Montefiore, a student then at Oxford, daughter of Hugh Montefiore, the Bishop of Birmingham, whom Henry knew, was one of those demonstrators. Henry recognised her and doffed his mortarboard and gave her a courteous bow. She shrank away from the demonstration. The 70s and 80s saw the admission of women to colleges at Oxford and Cambridge that had formerly been all male. Peterhouse admitted its first female students four years before Henry arrived as master. And when he arrived, it still had a reputation as a rather notoriously misogynistic college. So one of his tasks was to get the male faculty to behave in a civilised way to their female academic colleagues, especially at dinner. He succeeded. His natural graciousness and kindness set the tone and others followed. And he was much loved by the students of Peterhouse too. Women were ordained as priests in the Church of England in 1994. Henry, who had for so long been engaged in ecumenical work with Rome, worried that it would be an impediment to further talks and hopes of reunion. But especially with the encouragement of his three daughters and wife, I think, he saw the ordination of women as priests as an intrinsic good for the church, the right thing to do, and so he was supportive. I can speak to that personally. 
He was immensely supportive of my vocation as a scholar priest, and he and Peggy were on the front row of the chapel when I was installed as Dean of Divinity at New College in Oxford in 2001. As I hope you've realised throughout this lecture, Henry had a really fantastic sense of humour. I'll just give you a couple more examples. The first one, to Owen. I'm invited to lecture at Berkeley, April 1987, on immortality. I have said that I will come if I am alive. And a turn of phrase often reveals Henry's smile as he was writing, this one to Owen in 1974. A consortium of influenza gnomes has lately moved in on me and I am unable to do my job except at half speed. To all that I have said about Henry's multiple contributions, I might also add the role of influencer. Not in the sense we understand that word today, but as one who was at the centre of the academic establishment, a vast society of scholars across the UK, across Europe and across the USA, with links also to many of the Church of England's networks. In this he was joined by his brother Owen, also a formidably successful and talented church historian of the Reformation and modern period, and also an Anglican priest, who had a parallel career of equal distinction, entirely based in Cambridge. Owen was Master of Selwyn College, Dixie Professor of Ecclesiastical History, and then Regis Professor of History there. He also served as President of the British Academy in the 1980s. Both were scholar priests who remained in the world of academia, though there were always rumours of what bishoprics they had been offered and had refused and speculation in the newspapers that one or other of them might be offered a bishopric that was empty. In 1972, the Daily Telegraph thought Henry a probable to become Bishop of Durham, while in 1984, the satirical magazine Private Eye speculated that the honey-voiced Henry Chadwick would become the next Bishop of Oxford. Together, as scholars and the very best of friends, always supportive of each other, writing regularly to each other, even when they were both living and working in Cambridge, they sat at the heart of the world of theological and historical scholarship in the second half of the 20th century in Britain. Their opinions were sought and revered, not only on matters of scholarship, but also on the key academic and clerical appointments of the day. Both were given numerous honours, including knighthoods, though as clerics they did not use the title Sir. They rejoiced in each other's successes. When Owen received the Order of Merit from the Queen in 1983, a very special honour because only 24 people can hold it at any one time, Henry wrote, Frater carissime, the family is in overjoyed at your OM. It is fitting that there is a plaque to these brothers in Westminster Abbey. It was unveiled in February 2018 after they had both died. It simply reads Owen Chadwick 1916 to 2015 and Henry Chadwick 1920 to 2008. Priests and scholars. Roberta Amundsen and all the monks of St Michael's Abbey, you have extended a great and lasting honour to Henry Chadwick in building such a fine home for his superb library and it will be a wonderful resource for so many scholars. In turn, I believe that the man fits the honour for Henry Chadwick was a great scholar, priest and person as I hope this lecture has conveyed. And now in closing, I thank you for the great honour you have given me in inviting me to speak about this remarkable man. Thank you.